Good morning and welcome to Open Mics for, with Dr. Stites for this Wednesday, March the 23rd. I'm Dr. Steve Stites, Chief Medical Officer here at the University of Kansas Health System. Delighted to be back with you this morning. Today, we're going to hear the story of a local pediatrician struggling to cut through his brain fog after catching a mild case of COVID two years ago. Helping him are Dr. Eric Eklund Johnson, a clinical neuropsychologist, and Jamie Johnson, a speech therapist in outpatient rehab. They use we therapy, a similar approach taken for stroke patients. We're gonna break down how this therapy is working to help this, this great pediatrician, helping to restore full brain function months after contracting COVID. Mostly, we're just gonna talk a little bit about what long COVID looks like. We're gonna talk about what the brain injury can look like. We're gonna talk about how to get better from some of that brain injury. But first, let's check in with Jess this morning. She has her latest headlines. Good morning, Jess. Jess, I can't hear you. Dr. Seitz, can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Okay, so in this morning's medical headlines this morning, more and more teens are suffering and battling from depression, but it might actually not be COVID and social media that are to blame necessarily this time. A researcher in San Francisco say teens exposed to air pollution from things like power plants and car exhaustion, they may be more likely to experience depression related symptoms. And they say this is this is true no matter where they live, whether it be in, in the city or in urban areas, it didn't matter. They say air pollution causes inflammation in the brain, which can then lead to depression. Okay, this year's flu vaccine offered little to no protection against the virus. The CDC says the vaccine was only around 16% effective, a rate that it said was quote, not statistically significant. Flu cases started in October and lasted through May. And despite the vaccine's lackluster performance though this season, the CDC suggests that people get it to quote, prevent serious outcomes. How many times have you stepped on the scale and thought, oh my goodness. Okay, so a new article from the Canadian Medical Association finds by simply monitoring your weight, you can prevent weight loss. All you have to do is monitor it. Researchers found that those who took part in this three-year study and monitored their weight proved to be effective in packing on the pounds. They found by simply reducing your diet by just 100 calories a day and doing only 2,000 steps a day, people were able to prevent weight gain. Joseph Donnelly is the director of the center here locally, and he is a professor of internal medicine at the University of Kansas School of Medicine. Here's what he had to say. The general recommendations are to eat a balanced, reduced calorie diet. Uh, we use a lot of portion controlled meals. Um, our philosophy is that it's difficult for people to self-regulate. I mean, that's pretty much how they got to where they needed to lose weight. Researchers say that those who simply monitored their weight, again, lost an average of 15 pounds through this study. Beware of the light. There is some new research out of Northwestern University that finds that any kind of light that you're exposed to before you sleep may increase the risk of several serious health conditions, including heart problems and even diabetes. Researchers say the light increases your heart rate, but also made your body more insulin resistant. Dr. Seitz. All right, so let me get this straight, Jess. I should sleep <laughs> in the dark, I should yep. watch what I eat, and I should not breathe polluted air. These sound like solid, safe recommendations to me. I like Yeah, it. there's no fun, and you have to stay off your phone late at night, which I know is hard for you to do. Yeah, I do have a struggle with that. But, yeah. you know, I do think there's a lot of good advice that they – and I'll tell you what, you know, that bit about the influenza, I think we have seen that, that the influenza vaccine may not have been as helpful. But I think we've also seen that people – we aren't seeing as many influenza patients as we normally do. And I think that some of the infection control precautions we've seen out in the public – um, now, largely uh, gone, but but by but earlier in the year, in the height of the, what would have been the flu season, I think we had some pretty good results from, from that because we didn't see as much flu as we normally do. Make sure to get your questions sent in to us on YouTube, Facebook, the Medical News Network, and now Twitter. You will find links to those right here on your screen. We're going to get a check on the latest COVID numbers with Doc Hawk in just a few minutes. Let's start. Make sure there's no reporter questions today. 
All right, so this month marks two years since the start of the pandemic here in the United States. For countless people, it also marks two years of a nightmare, COVID long haul syndrome. I'm not trying to be overly dramatic here. You know, long haul syndrome is really difficult to manage. And, and one of the, the folks, folks in my family have had it, and they have some long haul symptoms. This is a struggle. And for some, that includes symptoms similar to a brain injury, a traumatic brain injury, say for a concussion or other disease. Alexis Del Cid introduces us to a local doctor whose entire life and livelihood were put on hold because of long haul syndrome. It's happening to him. The speech pathologist who's helping to treat pediatrician Thomas Seck says she's using the same treatments for his long haul brain fog that she uses on stroke patients, people who've had concussions or other brain injuries. I can talk a lot longer and interact a lot longer if I don't make eye contact. You can tell he knows what he wants to say, but for pediatrician Thomas Seck, turning those thoughts into words is a struggle. Coming to see Jamie is helping me get to that next step where I can start trying to um, do better functionally. Part of his long haul therapy includes regular sessions with the University of Kansas Health System speech pathologist Jamie Johnson. The therapy in the beginning was more to help me like be able to walk and talk at the same time, um, be able to use a phone again, be able to use my computer again. His goal now is even more basic. I need my brain to work and I need it to work for more than 20 minutes at a time. When the Kansas City pediatrician came down with COVID in March of 2020, he says it brought on a fatigue so extreme he'd never experienced anything like it. Uh, I was sleeping 17 hours a day. There were days I was only awake half an hour, an hour at a time. He says he never had a fever and only had body aches for a few hours in the very beginning. He had a single coughing fit, which lasted only about an hour. When he thought his body was better, he went back to work, only to realize that his brain wasn't functioning properly. It was probably a week into going back to work that I knew something was significantly wrong. We started in about May of 2020, seeing patients who were complaining of brain fog, and many of them had trouble finding their words. They were having memory problems. A lot of the appointment like this, because if I take balance out of the picture um, and eye contact out of the picture, and I only have to answer a question, I, it's, I, my stamina is better. I can do it longer. It's no way to live and certainly no way to get back to what he loves, which is taking care of sick children. And for some reason, this month out of the past 24 has been rougher than normal. This has been a bad month for my brain over the last six weeks have been a bad month for my brain overall. Yeah, this this is tough, and, and it just it just sounds so much even like post concussion syndrome. You know, for most COVID nineteen lasts a handful of days with minor symptoms, moderate symptoms, uh, but for an estimated thirty seven percent who contract the virus, symptoms can linger for weeks, months, and even years. As we've seen just now, one of the most common symptoms of long COVID is the brain fog we've just heard about. It is a life-altering condition characterized by slow thinking, confusion, difficulty remembering things, poor concentration, and fatigue and exhaustion. Because I think one of the things we know, people, they can function highly for a little while, but then they just get worn out so fast. And it's fascinating what you talked about. If I sit upright, I'm having to work at keeping my balance in, in space, so if I lay my head down, I can talk with you longer. That's tough. Joining us this morning are Dr. Eric Eklund Johnson and Jamie Johnson. Good morning to both of you. Let's talk a little more about Dr. Seck. Is he able to currently practice medicine, guys? Dr. Johnson? Well, I've not been directly involved in his care, so I, I don't feel like I can really comment on that. Maybe Jamie, uh, Jamie might have thoughts. As a speech therapist, of course I have words. Um, he is not able to currently work. Um, he is coming in for therapy and he's doing various, uh, he's doing vestibular therapy as well. So vision therapy in addition to that. So he's pretty involved in his 
um, therapies at this point. We, the goal is to get him back to work. So this sounds hauntingly similar to post-concussion syndrome. Are you seeing, does yes. that feel like that to you too? Yeah, initially, you know, we thought all of our great speech therapists on the inpatient side are seeing patients who have swallowing issues. And then all of a sudden our first one patient came around and I will never forget him, but he, um, all of a sudden, he's got cognitive issues. He's got this brain fog that will not go away. And so we have to figure out what do we do? How do we treat them? And so we go back to the research that we base our practice on and that is looking at how we treat someone with a brain injury, what tests we use to be able to evaluate them and then take the treatment from there. So um, he can't really practice like this, obviously. Is there a timeline that you can see out there that might help to, to know when he might be able to return? That's the tricky part. We even did therapy in the lobby the other day because, you know, you've got to get him used to having a mom and two kiddos or three running around in a clinic room um, waiting for him to think and evaluate. And so there's not necessarily a timeline that we know of, but our goal is to get him back to work. Has he made progress? made progress because it sounds like yeah. the last six weeks have not been as good for him what do you think why is that I think it's because he's challenging himself more oh, he's pushing it a little yeah. harder okay and that's a hard thing because our instinct is to push ourselves we want to push ourselves to get better that doesn't always work with the brain though the brain has to have that kind of you can push to a certain point and then right. you have to break is there like an exercise component to this too where you'd have this graded exercise like you see in in, in return after concussion yes exactly that exertion piece yeah um, comes into play a lot of times when we do therapy we'll take pieces out so if he's having to use his brain we take away the vision piece of it if we're walking and talking which we do a lot we'll take him and walk to different parts of the hospital and he has an assignment that he has to remember and then come back and remember things and if he has that exertion you see a change in it. Yeah this whole vestibular axis is so interesting to me because we know that when patients like this have to function and they have to follow their eyes and maintain their balance in space it's exhausting to them. Yeah. What do you think that's about? So the walking and talking is a hard piece and yeah. if you've got brain fog on top of that that makes it even trickier for people. And so figuring out how do we reduce that cognitive stamina, reduce the physical stamina, but yet work on getting their mental flexibility to the point that they can return to work. You know, that walk and talk thing. Many people have said, I don't do that very well as I collide mm -hmm. with different objects in the hallway, maybe doors, maybe <laughs> windows. Dr. Johnson, talk about brain fog. How common is it in the people you have seen here in the Metro? Yeah, well, I would say it's it's quite common, um, and as you know, you're kind of alluding to there, not um, it's not necessarily unique to the long haul COVID syndrome. It, it is in many ways similar to what we might see symptom wise in other conditions, including uh, post concussion syndrome or uh, you know people recovering from other illness and, and injury that. Uh, uh, can significantly impact how their uh, brains function. And so uh, really, you know, the goal uh, in working with great uh, therapists like Jamie is to increase that physical and mental stamina um, and to you know, build that up uh, kind of gradually and get to that, you know, get to that threshold of whatever way you can really. Yeah, that, that, that is so, I mean, it's got to be so frustrating because you don't know when you're going to get better. Has everybody you've seen eventually get gotten better or do some people struggle and kind of plateau? Well, I, I think so, you know, that we're in early stages of the research on, on this, but again, there's reason to think that it's similar to outcomes from other conditions that can cause brain fog. And so, um, it, you know, I, I tend to be, based on that research, optimistic and hopeful that people will get, if not 100% of their previous baseline, will get much better and, and, and close to that in, in most cases. And so, uh, you know, some people get there quickly, some people take a bit longer. There are things that can complicate the recovery. Um, sleep is often disrupted, uh, the, uh, the physical as well as mental fatigue. Uh, pain, other factors, uh, uh, not surprisingly, uh, people uh, facing these kind of long haul symptoms, uh, there's a, a higher level of depression and anxiety than in, in the general public. And so dealing with all those things along with, uh, you know, as you're going through those therapies is an important piece as well. 
So when I forget things at the grocery store or something I was supposed to do for my wife or maybe with the CF team, can I, can I, can I just claim brain fog? Uh, you, you can certainly claim that. Uh, <laughs> and I think, you know, all of us can, I think, identify to some extent with this because we all, you know, we've all been, had those times when we're sleep deprived or uh, whatever, and we, you know, get, get a, a small piece of this, but, you know, people are experiencing that on a, uh, a much more consistent and, uh, and maybe severe uh, basis in, in many cases. Well, and I think what it's important to note that if you've had a critical illness, if you've been in the hospital for a long time or in the ICU, if you've had that viral illness or you have that terrible headache and your mind feels just numb, that is a form of brain fog. And you know we're hoping that you're gonna get a little better from that, those things, and most often we do, but sometimes that getting better can take such a long time. What type of things are folks forgetting? Well, so it's often what you know people in the general public will refer to as short-term memory. Um, a, a neuropsychologist might refer to it as prospective memory. You know, it's often what 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 did I set out to do? You know, why did I come to this room? Uh, you know, quickly losing that sort of information, uh, kind of that memory for our intention of what we were uh, planning to do. Yeah, I also call that aging, unfortunately. <laughs> So, That's Jamie, Eric just mentioned, yeah, just, thank God we have a script that I can read from. <laughs> Eric just mentioned things like certain words and speech. As a speech therapist, how difficult is it to retrain someone to remember words they once knew? So the retraining is an interesting thought. Um, what we're generally doing is looking at, let's evaluate how their visual spatial skills are, how their memory is, how their attention is, because a lot of times they'll say, hey, it's my memory, when actually it's their attention. And they've got, they're thinking of 10 different things, and when they're doing that, they forget what they're getting ready to say to the person who's in front of them. It might be you're sitting at a restaurant, as an example, um, and you're having a conversation with somebody, and you're figuring that tip out in your head too and figuring out, okay, when I leave here, where am I gonna go? And all of a sudden you've got too many things going. So add some brain fog onto that and we're all in trouble. You know, that sounds like my normal morning routine mm -hmm. right there. I put some eye drops in my eyes every morning and then I put them in and I'm thinking about other stuff, planning for the day, my beeper's going off, my pager's going off, whatever. And all of a sudden I don't remember if I put my eye drops in. I know the issue isn't that I can't remember if I put my eye drops in. The, the issue is where was my attention while I was putting the eye drops in? And that intentionality is incredibly important for our memory formation. And in addition, when you've got brain fog, I think it's harder to be intentional. And so it all it all comes home to roost. What what is the biggest thing that you guys are seeing? What's the biggest challenge that people with brain fog have, Dr. Johnson? Well, I, you know, I think in many cases, anyway, it's it's kind of getting that stamina back, getting uh, uh, comfortable with that level of kind of mental effort and uh, and the physical stamina as well, um, and. Uh, you know, from my perspective, Jamie's much more involved in the day-to-day, -day, you know, closely working with these people as they're recovering. So she probably has a, a better take on that than I do. But I, I think building that stamina and that confidence back mm -hmm. as well. Jamie, thoughts? Yeah, I do feel like we're, it's, the cheerleader part is a big part of it. But putting strategies in place to help someone. So knowing, okay, you know, sometimes when you have somebody who can step back and say, these are the things you need to do to help with that attention, to help you remember where you are in your routine, which is extremely important. So being able to focus and do one thing at a time, sometimes even com completing com complex tasks, easy for me to say, I'm a speech therapist, complex tasks early in the day so that um, you're not at the end of the day, your brain is done and you've got to figure your checkbook and pay your bills and transfer money. So having somebody who can step back and say, let's put these things in place is usually the first step. When they leave our office after an evaluation, they have strategies that hopefully will help them kind of organize their thoughts, organize their brain, help them with attention and memory both. You know, um, and just to say, because I didn't know this when I started, and guys, it wasn't in the script. While we have Johnson and Johnson on the set, <laughs> they're not related, just to say that they obviously work together and, and do well together. But Jay and Jay, not related, like the shot or something. I don't know, Johnson and Johnson. I had to make something with that. I kind of flipped it up, right? <laughs> yeah, you would. All right, it's tough. How, how tough is it for you both to see uh, folks uh, struggle like this? Because this has got to be tough. Because especially someone like this young physician who you just don't know what's going to happen. Dr. Johnson. 
Well, you know, certainly it's tough. Um, it, you know, again, it, it, it's it's something similar to what we often see with other conditions as well. Uh, you know, a lot of the symptoms are very similar to brain fog with other conditions. And so, it, you know, based on that experience and, and what we have, you know, the research base that we have uh, uh, thus far, uh, I think there's reason for optimism. People will, uh, in many cases, if not most, get there. But uh, but yeah, it can it, it can be frustrating and it can be a long haul. Long haul, no pun intended. All right, we're going to interrupt for just a minute. We're going to move to treatments because we're going to first turn to Doc Hawk with the numbers, and then you and I are going to talk a little bit about some data that came out last night. So let's first. What do you think? And how how are our numbers looking today? You know, numbers are holding steady. Sixteen active infections one in the ICU and zero on the ventilator, still 58 in that recovery period. But see, we've had some of these people in the recovery period that have just been here a long time. For a really well. long yeah. time. Yeah, I was asking Amanda yesterday, what's up with the ones that are here for so long? Yeah. And some of them are just people who have been really had severe injury, even get, getting us back to the Delta wave now, mm -hmm. and they're still in the hospital because they're so sick. It's yeah. been a long, a long haul once again. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're just kind of being consistent from the beginning, just really not – it's just continuing to say they're in that recovery period really until the discharge essentially. So. I think yesterday we had 22 acutes around 1230 or so in the afternoon and um, at that point I asked Amanda, I said Amanda, it, 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 and Amanda Cackler, you all remember her, she's on the program a lot, she does a great job for us yeah. um, and uh, our, our head of infection prevention and control and, and so I said how many of those 22 patients are here with strictly COVID yeah. and not from something else? And I think the answer got back was kind of informative. Mm -hmm. It looked like six of those 22 clearly had COVID. Yeah. Six of those, <clears> or <throat> five of those patients, um, maybe it wasn't it's clear if it was possible. COVID or something else, mm -hmm. but COVID probably exacerbated the underlying condition. Yeah. And the other 11 were testing positive, but here for other reasons. And so I think that's inter it's just something to note around the mm -hmm. Omicron and with like native immunity and, 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 and vaccination. But I do think that is different, Steve, than during the surge when we had yeah. a majority of patients here for symptomatic disease. Now we still understand that there is, even though the numbers are going down, we still do understand that there is a large uh, circulation of the virus in the community. And so people can test positive. Uh, but like you said, a third are here probably for symptomatic COVID disease. A third are here essentially because they're symptomatic, but they have alternative diagnosis as well. And I think as we continue to have a circulation of virus and the disease in the community, we will continue to see these active infections. Hopefully it'll get down to two or zero like it was at one point. But March um, 2021, I right. remember it. I'm yeah. looking. But we're not there. We're, we're not, not there not just there. yet. Yeah, that's a concern. So a couple of things that I think came out overnight, interesting news actually. One, you know, studies in coming out of Africa demonstrate that about two thirds of individuals have had COVID-19, mm -hmm. yet the death rate is much lower than mm -hmm. in the US and other developed nations. Thoughts about that? Yeah, I was trying to read into that. I think, you know, I just don't know. I think there's, there's a lot of caveats to observational or retrospective uh, looks at these things. Um, you know, how is, uh, how accurately is some of the data and the deaths? Because we've also heard other things that, you know, really the deaths are probably three to five times what they're actually counted as. And so I think it's just difficult, but it, it certainly is interesting to know. Uh, but that doesn't, we should not minimize or diminish the disease in those other countries as well, because we know they continue, they have suffered. But I think it was an interesting data point. It was an interesting data point. And I think yeah. one of the things that was pointed out is the average age is so much younger yeah. in, in many nations in Africa. Now, if you turn to South Africa, South Africa is kind of in between. They've had a higher death rate. Mm -hmm. And so then you come to some of the developed countries where, um, like the U.S. or Europe, where we have an older age, age distribution and we're seeing a higher death rate and, 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 more, and, and more comorbid illnesses mm -hmm. yeah. and a little less active lifestyle. And I think those things go together. So my guess is the older you do, the worse you do. Yeah, and I think that's one thing. I'm, uh, I agree. You know, in the South African, that first data set that came about Omicron, uh, we did say even though they might be a little bit older than uh, some other African countries, they are younger than here uh, in the United States or in Europe. But they also gave that caveat about some of the, uh, the Qatari data as well, which is just like Israel, they have kind of been uh, some of the leaders of some of the initial uh, on the forefront of that information that we get about new variants and vaccination and everything. So 
I think age has a lot to do with it. I think it. I think it does. Then Moderna says, "Hey, our shot in yeah. you know young children actually looks pretty good, although the percent effectiveness wasn't great mm-hmm. at preventing a symptomatic disease. I think it was about forty percent or so, at different ages, different doses. But, but um, you know, maybe a little better than Pfizer's, but still not robust. Not yeah. what we've been seeing in adults. Yeah. And I think you know, I think we do, we just play into that as well. And I think number one. Uh, the biggest thing is we know that in general the children aren't as affected as adults so that is a great thing and if we can use anything to help reduce um, the chance that your child does go to the hospital even though it might be infrequent to rare your chance that your child gets multi-system inflammatory disorder or even long-haul symptoms I think it would be a good thing yeah and then I keep reading uh, and trying to follow the BA2 surge in, in Europe and so far it's early yeah but while there is a surge and we tend to lag four six eight weeks behind and so maybe May ish or June is mm-hmm. which we'd really see the impact here in our yeah. area but um, hospitalizations aren't climbing but again very early in Europe yeah and I think you know um, we've talked about that too and Sometimes we can just see people in the hospital for other reasons. Um, I think it was different during the Delta and Omicron surge. I think we did have a lot of people here for symptomatic disease. But just as you said, here, you know, our sequencing and reporting data is not uh, necessarily optimal for being up to date. Unfortunately, uh, we know that the CDC and we were going with the therapeutic uh, committee yesterday because, Steve, we are transitioning from citrovimab um, to now the... uh, Bevlatovimab, which does look to have activity against BA2, and that is one of the monoclonal antibodies. Um, And so we are getting this and switching this because the data, um, unfortunately, what is reported in the CDC, this was reported yesterday, they only have data from March 5th, and at that point it was about 12.5% of isolates were BA2. They did do the forecast or the now cast um, for the week of March 19th, and that looks to be about 35% of isolates. But again, that is a forecast, but because of that, we have switched to the monoclonal antibody now that looks to have activity against. And we uh, know the wastewater testing is on the rise yeah. or the BA2 variant. It's more transmissible than the BA1 variant. And so yeah. we'll follow that information clearly. Uh, we're hoping it stays low because, honestly, we'd like fewer COVID patients in the hospital so we can have much more of a normal lifestyle, both inside the hospital and out in the community. All right, let's switch back now to the br- to brain fog condition and talk about therapy. Cause we, we hinted at this a little bit ago about exercise, et cetera. But, Jamie, what other kind of things can we do to retrain the brain? Because I want to learn because I may try something. All right, mm-hmm. so we um, we mainly looking at um, how are we doing with our attention. And so if we work both at attention and we do different things with numbers or words or things in a cl- quiet setting versus in a noisy setting, especially if they're getting ready to go back to work, we're going to work those things and do different activities to really challenge them. We know if they get to the point where they know they need to take a break, then that tells them, hey, if I feel like this and I have these triggers, then I know at work or at home I need to be able to take a break. So kind of working those different areas of the brain. Yeah, I think that sounds very important. Dr. Johnson, thoughts that you have? Yeah, I I mean, uh, I'd certainly agree. And as you mentioned earlier about what I might call prospective memory, the other big piece, is, as Jamie has been talking about here, to what people often perceive or or experience as memory problems is that uh, complex attention where, you know, you're you're dealing with multiple bits of information, both kind of inside and from outside and, and trying to uh, make sense of all those things. It's, we we often don't think about how much of that, how bombarded we are by things uh, uh, much of the time, but when it becomes harder to uh, take in and process that much information, you have to, uh, find ways of being more selective about it. Yeah, that makes complete sense. And then, um, Jamie, what kind of speech therapy works best? And talk to us a little bit about what you, you do in speech therapy. Okay. So we'll do different activities. Many times I look back to see what people are reporting. So they're saying, um, I almost feel like I'm stuttering sometimes, or I can't finish my thoughts, or I can't finish my sentence. And so, you know, putting some pressure on or having them do two things at once and then three things. and 
just trying to simulate what you would do in normal life is what we're trying to get at because we want it as functional as possible. We can put you on a computer and we can have you do different activities, but if that's not something you do at work, how functional is that? So we really look at how functional things are in returning people to either work or to school. We've had college age kids who have to sit through a lecture and so figuring out, okay, we've got to start with having you listen to a podcast maybe that's only five minutes long, or we've got to have you be able to listen to two people talking and go in between or looking at a PowerPoint. So finding different ways that they're used to learning and really taking that and running with that to help them at this point in their lives. So Dr. Ackland Johnson, sorry I've been calling you Dr. Johnson. That's brain fog on my part and a lack of attention to short-term memory, but that doesn't surprise anyone who actually knows me. What can we do to prevent brain fog if you get COVID-19? Well, so the, I was going to go, the last part of what you said there, the best thing is to try to prevent getting COVID, get, you know, get your shots and everything. But of course, uh, what, once that's been the case, you've uh, had COVID, you know, I think the things, the best things from my perspective, other than, you know, working with someone like Jamie and increasing, you know, getting those comp, uh, compensation strategies, increasing your mental and physical stamina, things like that are taking care of those other issues that can complicate recovery. So making sure you're getting good sleep, um, you know, taking care of yourself in terms of um, dealing, working with your providers, dealing with uh, the other physical issues that uh, might complicate your recovery and taking care of yourself from a, a mental perspective, you know, dealing, if you're experiencing symptoms of depression and anxiety, uh, you know, communicate with your healthcare providers about that. And there are effective treatments for those things as well that can help move things along. Yeah, I think it's all about trying to prevent the disease because you don't want long haul syndrome, Hawkeye. And we know that the rules of infection control yeah. travel with you and protect you. And they mm -hmm. take and take them with you everywhere you go because they really, really, really do work. Mm -hmm. And uh, we may think that Omicron is milder until it's not. We think that COVID-19 COVID is something that's made up until it's not. And uh, that yes, many people have been sick and, and, and died with COVID-19. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's, that's the truth. And we know the, you know the great preventive measure is obviously vaccination and um, otherwise doing those public health uh, guidance measures. And if you feel uncomfortable about going into those situations, uh, meeting with people, meeting in, in certain areas, uh, you know, indoors versus outdoors and doing all those things, then, you know, you are certainly obliged not to do those, but also wear your mask. You know, we know masks do protect, uh, despite what we, we've heard, that the data supports mask use, even if others around you aren't wearing masks. Yeah, I think that's the bottom line is you know how to take care of yourself. Do it if you want to stay safe. All right, let's turn to Jess and see what kind of community questions we have, because I bet we have a few. Yes, we do. Good morning. Okay, so Jo Ellen just brings up a really good um, comment. She said, the courage this pediatrician, um, the patient that we've been talking about today has shown, um, she feels like she just showed a ton of courage. And so we just always want to appreciate our, our patients for allowing us to share their um, their stories so that we can better understand some of these topics. So, um, but a question is, is mixing up words a sign of official brain fog? What do you think? Is mixing up words? Because if it is, I'm usually foggy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was going to say, do they feel foggy? I mean, we can all mix up our words. You heard me do it, too. And I don't have brain fog, I hope. Um, but I think that's part of it. There's always mm -hmm. an underlying, there's a point to which everything is normal. Just like you said, you can't remember the five things that your wife asked you to get to the store or whatever. Um, and so how much is normal and how much is the cause of brain fog or something like that? And I think, um, and I'll, I'll speak to Dr. Ackley Johnson as well as Jamie here, as we get older, we, our memories aren't quite as good anyway. So what part of this is just aging and what part of this is something we should be paying attention to because it's not aging? How do we know? Well, uh, I would say that uh, you, you're absolutely right. You know, these things, I'm noticing that myself as I get older, but- uh, <laughs> It's unfortunate. Uh, yeah, when it starts to really impact your daily function, when you're noticing a change in your ability to to really do the things that are a normal part of your day, 
uh, that's when it probably crosses over into being a concern as opposed to when you're occasionally noticing, you know, you can't find the word, you know, who is that actor in that movie or, or, or whatever, uh, or mixing up a, a word uh, from time to time. It's when it's really starting to, you know, you're noticing an impact on your ability to go about your usual daily activities. That, that That's when it is probably more concerning. Yeah, I, 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 uh, I think that that's probably it's some good advice about how much does it really impact your daily activities and once it kind of flips over that side where, man, I can't quite do what I'm supposed to do, that's a warning flag to us all. Jess? Isaac wants to know, um, are any of our brain fog patients uh, that we know about able to drive? Is this not recommended? Hmm. Well, what I, what I know about brain fog is that, Jamie, um, driving is one of those visual things that is exhausting because there's so much motion going on around you. Yeah, and then they have to come here where they have to drive into our parking garage, and then they yeah, have to figure right. out where they're going after they've gotten off of I-35 or whatever. So, yeah, but, yes, we do have many of our patients drive. But it probably depends on the severity of their disease mm -hmm. and where they are in the recovery period. It does. And, you know, we think we can get into a car and drive. We've been doing it since we were 14 or 16, whatever. We don't realize what all goes into it. It's not just remembering where you're going or how to get home. It's also what, what's happening visually around you. What's your attention doing? What's happening if the radio is on and you're trying to drive? So there's a lot that goes into driving. So most of them, I would say, yes, they're driving. But there are some who don't. Please stop. Please stop. Jess? Oh, we don't hear you, Jess. Is there an explanation, Gene wants to know, as to why some people suffer with brain fog maybe more than another person? Hmm. Okay, experts, I, I, don't, I, I got nothing on no. this one. Million dollar question, yeah. we don't know. <laughs> Dr. Eckman yeah, Johnson. It's hard to say, I mean, yeah, so, uh, it, it is hard to, predict it uh, many times but you, you know again i would come back to in some cases at least it may be some of these other complicating factors that uh, you make it harder or longer to recover for some people you know are there is their sleep disrupted uh are they in a lot of pain uh are, are you know are they having these vestibular symptoms that are uh, annoying and distracting and, and, and make things more difficult, uh, you know, addressing things like those. Yeah. Sleep is huge too. Sleep and anxiety. Yeah. You know, anxiety is exhausting. And we've talked a little bit about this program. There's a lot of things to be anxious about. There's, you know, the war, there's COVID, climate change, all these different things. And, mm -hmm. and it, and you only have so much bandwidth it, and it does, mm -hmm. it causes a lot of fatigue and I think emphasizes the underlying fog folks feel. And I think what we have to remember is when you go into a day, you have so much energy to devote, right? And if you're devoting part of your energy to these other things that are causing so much anxiety, you're just, you're going to run out of energy for other things faster. And I think that 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 energy drain, if you will, uh, can really affect our day to day lives. Jess, Melissa wants to know: Is this covered? Is the therapy covered under insurance for long haulers? Oh, there's a good. That's a really good question. Okay. Sometimes. So that's the worst thing is to have someone come in and you send them away with their strategies because you know they have mild or maybe mild to moderate issues, and their insurance denies it. So that is not a fun piece. Well, and just to say, there's been active legislation being discussed about can you be disabled on the, on the basis of brain mm -hmm. fog? Because that's mm -hmm. hard to do. It's new, this long haul syndrome. Mm -hmm. I think it's gotten a little better now. But you know, this is a constant battle because one insurance is not another insurance. And you may have a really good insurance, and it may not cover counseling. It may cover your prescription drugs. But therapy, mental therapy, may not be, or even speech therapy, may not be part of that. And so it's very dependent upon your individual policy and plan, and, um, and, and, and it's hard. I, I do think that, and, and you all can comment, uh, is, is whether or not you think that insurance companies are getting better about covering long-haul therapy for, for brain fog. Has that gotten better? Maybe. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's very insurance dependent, Jess. So Sharon wants to know, she had a stroke and was hospitalized back in November of 2020. Brain fog was is a major problem for her now. She said she felt like she was getting better um, with the stroke fog until COVID hit. Is there something, is this something she should be checking with her neurologist on? Dr. Eklund Johnson, thoughts? 
Um, I think the short answer is yes. I think it would be a, a very good idea to to um, bring up with the, the neurologist and uh, see what other if there's a recommendation for any further workup of that or, or therapies. Uh, yeah, definitely, I would I would recommend that. You know, I think what we know is that if you have an underlying disease, that disease is more susceptible to being um, um, worsened if you get COVID-19. So diabetes, your blood sugars become more difficult to control. There's a higher incidence of insulin resistance in type 2 diabetes after having had COVID-19. And I think what we're going to, what we'll probably find with brain fog, and you guys comment on this thought, um, is that uh, if you already have a brain injury and then get COVID-19, you're more susceptible to the brain fog that could occur from COVID-19. So that underlying injury sets you up for further disease. Jamie? Yeah, totally agree. You can see that, especially if there's a concussion that's around that same time uh, or that brain injury bad. around it, yeah. it's like, which is which? Is it the brain fog mm -hmm. from the COVID or is it brain fog and cognitive issues yeah. post-concussion? Well, then that's so hard because we're so similar. I, mm -hmm. As you listen to it, I, you know, I have a, a very close family member who's got a significant problem from post-concussion syndrome. and I. And you watch that and you know the energy drain and how long you can stay focused on all the things we're talking about and the vestibular therapy, they're all the same thing really. And, and you just wonder, God, is this a response of the brain to injury of many different sorts? Talk a little bit about what vestibular therapy is because that's become such an important part of brain recovery. Yeah, so our great coworkers in physical therapy are also vestibular therapists. And so they're looking at what's happening with your vestibular system, your balance, your, how your eyes work within that balance and the exertion, how when you're moving, what's happening. And so putting all those pieces together. When we do an evaluation, one of the things we do is look at how those eyes are moving. And if we see those eyes aren't moving like they should, we know they probably need to be seen by our vestibular therapist to um, get to work on that. And there's ways to do that. You can do it um, in, in an ear, nose, and throat clinic. You can do it in a speech class. I suspect they're doing all sorts of ways so we can figure it out. But essentially, here's what happens with the way your, your, your brain works. If you stand up, you think, that is so easy because I'm standing up in space. But how do you stop from falling over to one side? It's because your eyes are working together with the back of your brain, with your middle ear, and with all these other what's called sensory proprioception that helps you maintain balance in space. You say, well, someone who's blind, how can they stand up? Well, because they have compensatory mechanisms and our brains are wired to be able to do that. But at the end of the day, what happens with concussion injury and brain fog in general is that those mechanisms are disrupted and so you have a harder time doing simple tasks, whether it's tying your shoe or it's standing up and walking across the room. And in order to do that, other parts of your brain are working overtime to help compensate. And when that occurs, you wear out faster because that energy, remember we said, there's much energy you have a day, that er energy is getting drained. So, so much of what we've talked to folks about is, you know, look, if you've got diabetes, make sure your blood sugars are really tightly controlled. If you've, if you're, you got to make sure you get the right kind of sleep, get the right kind of nutrition, eat a balanced diet, and try and do these kind of gradual recovery exercises. That it all comes together, Jess. Dr. Seitz, uh, two quick questions. Katie wants to know: Is brain fog also associated with the long-term stress of COVID and the isolation behind it? Oh, so can the okay? That's a great question, Dr. Eklund Johnson. Thought thoughts about that, and I think what the I think what the listener is trying to get at is, is is a is the fact that people have been so isolated and had all this stress has that maybe caused more of an incidence of brain fog once people had COVID? Well, I think you know we have. Uh, I'd like to see more research, and I think we're starting to get maybe some answer to that. But but I I believe that it, it's likely true that that's a, for many people at least an exacerbating factor. Um, you know, we talked about anxiety, how that can kind of sap your mental resources and and uh, that that stress, that anxiety. Um, I, I've no doubt in my you know in my thinking that, that that's a factor for many people. Jess, you said you had another one. I, well, well, okay, Joellen wants to know, can you just speak to the fatigue and exhaustion piece of this? She says it's really difficult for those not suffering to understand. Oh, that's a, okay, mm -hmm. Jamie, let's make it real. Yeah, well, you saw that in Dr. Sec. I mean, you watched him both from a vestibular standpoint, like we just talked about, but also the fatigue. And many times he will rest after therapy 
before he goes home. And um, that, that fatigue is a fatigue that he describes as nothing he's ever encountered. And often at times, I think patients can have headaches, can have all sorts of diseases that are, our symptoms go along with this. You know, we've heard the term mind and body. The reality is your mind is part of your body. And when you are wearing it out because you have had an injury, you're just exhausted. And the way your body and your brain or what they're saying to you is, you got to rest me. And the way you have to rest is, 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 is sleep or just sitting down and doing nothing. Even watching television can be exhausting because your mind is trying to interpret those images and that uses your brain energy. You saw in his interview that, the, that the, our pediatrician, he put his head down on the desk to talk to people. Why is that? He's not having to stay upright in space. He's not trying, his brain and his body are not trying to engage in you know, keeping you upright and trying to look around the room. And so he can divert more energy to the conversation. Your brain consumes the most energy of any organ in your body by far. And when it has an injury and it's trying to compensate, Imagine how much energy you're going to consume and how much rest you're going to need. That was a great ex That sounded great. Jess. Uh, just last question from Pat. Maybe we can incorporate this into some final thoughts. But just overall, where does a person start? Where do they begin if they have a concern about the cause of brain fog? All right. Dr. Eklund Johnson, let's start with you. What do you think the answer to that question is? And just your final thoughts for today. Well, I'd say it, it, specifically to that question, I would say, you know, bring it up probably first with your primary care provider and discuss with them the you know what you're experiencing and uh, if appropriate they can probably make the referrals that would uh, be needed to kind of move along with the, the process and then I guess you know final thoughts I would say we're still in pretty early stages of understanding this the research on cognitive or you know kind of mental thinking ability outcomes and and things like that from this uh, you know, from COVID illness is uh, still in a very early stage. But from what we've seen, both in this very initial bit of research that we're starting to get on this and with other conditions that can cause brain fog, there's definitely reason for um, hope, um, if not optimism, that you know, there are many of the pieces of this are treatable and people with appropriate uh, management of this are likely to improve. I would agree. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. That was very good. And I feel like time, a lot of people need time. Our research doesn't show. And as a society, we want to say, oh, this is going to be fixed. You know, if it were your arm, you'd say, this is what you're going to do after the surgery at four weeks and six weeks and eight weeks. It's not that way with your brain. So we can't necessarily, hey, you're going to get better like this. Sometimes it's like this. And sometimes it's with time. There's nothing like having somebody come in and do an evaluation and then find out, hey, I'm okay. And there's some reassurance in that. It's also great when you have somebody who's gone through therapy and they, you compare their testing at the end compared to the beginning and it's improved. So it is, we are hopeful and we do see improvements in that. Hawk, final thoughts. <laughs> final thoughts. Um, you know, I, I think it's important. I think this is one of the, uh, you know, concepts of long haul disease. It is important to continue to try to you know really find the etiology there's a question what causes it and i think it's really about individual genetic factors um, it's the same reason that why do some kids get severe disease and have multi-system inflammatory disorders why do some people who are otherwise healthy in the 30s get really sick and severe disease and die and i think it we don't have the answers to these questions yet i think they're very complex um, but we know what isn't complex, and we know ways to help prevent and reduce the risk of these things. It continues to be vaccination. I was just looking through some of those articles from last week from New England Journal of Medicine, and we talked about BA2. Um, and we know that uh, you know there will be meetings about fourth doses uh, of vaccination. But really looking back uh, on these articles, we know that even with your booster dose, you do develop neutralizing antibodies and increased protection against severe disease, even for BA2. And so I think right now it is more important than ever if you are not up to date with your vaccination to get up to date, get that booster dose. Uh, we know cases are low right now. This is the perfect time to do that. Uh, you know, there may be another surge. Uh, we've heard about that, uh, but time will tell. But what you can do to protect yourself in individually against uh, severe disease, but against even long haul symptoms is to get vaccinated 
and be up to date with those vaccinations. You know, um, as I listen to the conversation today, I think that the uh, parts that you heard from the Medical News Network early on that just were going through the medical news overnight are, are, are sort of instructive, right? Well, you listen to it. Teenagers have more problems with depression and other mental health issues when they live in a polluted environment. Okay. Kind of sounds a little like brain fog, right? You know, influenza vaccine may not work as well this year, but it probably still prevents severe disease. Okay, got that. That makes sense. Eating a healthy diet and exercising and not trying to overeat makes you live, is going to help your weight and help you live longer and help you live better. Okay. Exercise is good. Okay. At the end of the day, make good choices. We know what the good choices are. And when it comes down to COVID-19, what I would say is make good choices. It's a balance out there between your mental health for getting out in public and doing the things you want and your physical health and your mental health as a result of the complication of COVID-19 itself. Isolation can be terrible. Isolation from COVID-19 and long haul syndrome can be devastating. We don't probably talk enough about the long-term complications of COVID-19. They're very real which is why we try to inform you, our public, every day about things that we know that work and those things we know that don't really work because we want you to be able to make good choices. Jess. Okay, Dr. Seitz, my final thoughts are that I am loving. I know. This. What do you think? Well, so, you. okay. I walked in here. here. Here's a deal. Logan comes in here. Logan works in our studios. He's great. Logan, Anthony, our whole team here, they're outstanding. He says, you look like you just rolled off the train. And I don't mean a nice seat. Like the back box car. You just rolled off the train. I'm like, really? That bad, huh? You know what? I, I know you're doing this for, uh, for um, fundraising. Yes. And it's a great cause. And I think we should maybe extend that until we get zero active and pa- active infections oh, in the hospital, I and then shave. you can do it. I think more people will donate and you think that's it? fundraise, and yeah, for that well, great cause. You yes, can do it right, absolutely, right, right there. But and you know, on May six, we're going to have a video of me shaving everything, and I'm going to tell you I look like a Star Trek alien. Someday we'll show you a picture of what I'm going to look like after I shave. It's not pretty. <laughs> Well, I know Mrs. Stites likes the hair. I think it's a lady thing. We are liking it. Do you? All we right. We think you should keep it. I know you're going to shave it, and then you said you're going to grow it back out. Is that right? I, I think I'm going to, in the fall, I have a nice little, you know, camping, fishing trip planned, and I don't think I'm going to shave, and then I'll just let it grow after that. We'll see what happens. Very rugged, very cool. Okay, so yeah, uh, check out that QR code that we just popped up there and uh, help dots, Dr. Stites out. <laughs> okay, so now we want to show you some of our newest viewers. If we could pull up this picture of, uh, so this is Mrs. Kim Pitt's eighth grade class. They are at Gerard Middle School. So this group of folks, they watched as Mrs. Pitt's daughter, Katie, she was interviewed yesterday when we were upstairs live uh, inside our OR. We were talking about all of our hardworking nurses and our operating room nurses up there. Um, so you can see the students here, they were, they were watching our show yesterday. So we appreciate them. Um, just hanging out with us and uh, letting us show their pictures today and their smiling faces. And hopefully uh, we've got some new viewers and hopefully some budding healthcare workers and in, uh, in the future. So again, um, this is Pitts. Thanks for letting your kiddos watch the class yesterday. All right. So uh, anyway, we want to tell everyone, thanks so much for joining us. You can watch us later on YouTube and Facebook and Twitter and all that good stuff. Coming up tomorrow, we have kind of a cool update. You remember this girl, uh, she climbed uh, Mount Kilimanjaro last week and we shared her story so tomorrow so she donates this kidney to a stranger and then she turns around and climbs up a mountain you know who knew just it's crazy so we're going to meet her we're going to meet the the man who got her kidney and then the childhood friendship who really brought this whole story all together so you're going to meet all three of those folks tomorrow that is starting at 8 a.m so everyone have a great day we're going to send it over to alexis I'm Alexis Del Cid on the next All Things Heart. It's like Oreo cookies, you know, they just, and ice cream, they, they just can't say no. We'll tell you the science behind why you can't put that food down and what it does to your heart. Like Subscribe to our morning medical update and open mics with Dr. Stites podcast. Now everywhere podcasts are available.